it is a pleasure for me to introduce a globally recognized expert on pension governance uh, design and uh, investing. Uh, Keith Amartir um, is um, Emeritus Director of the International Center for Pension Management at the Rothman School of uh, Management in Toronto. And he's also president of uh, KPA uh, Advisory Services. Keith is going to uh, make the link between John Maynard Keynes and Peter Drucker and uh, future proofing of pensions. With this as an introduction, Keith, the stage is yours. Stan, thank you and uh, good day, everyone. Uh, as Stan mentioned, I uh, have been an advisor to uh, pension organizations around the world for uh, some number of decades. And uh, as part of that, I write a monthly advisory letter. Um, the uh, title of the September letter, just, just still fresh off the, off the press, you see in front of you, uh, Future Proofing Pensions, Integrating the Wisdom of John Maynard Keynes and Peter Drucker. Uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, take you through the main points of, uh, of the letter, uh, starting, as you see already there, this cool word, future proofing. What, uh, what does that mean? So went to Wikipedia, and there it is, the process of anticipating the shocks and stresses of future negative events and of developing methods to minimize their impacts. So if we apply that to uh, the world of, of pension investing and, uh, and management, um, what does that look like? What are these uh, future sho shocks and stresses that we should uh, uh, consider and think about? Uh, you see in front of you there uh, four. Uh, you could make it a much longer list, but I think these four will, will suffice. Uh, aging populations we're all very familiar with. Uh, it means rising depend dependency ratio of retirees to active workers. And um, what do we do about that? Well, uh, there are a number of things. The most obvious one, of course, is, and that is in fact happening, is working longer. And uh, if you look at OECD stats, for example, you see that uh, year by year, the average retirement age uh, has been going up. And I think we can expect that to continue to happen uh, in the decades ahead. Uh, on the financial side, uh, the, the other three points there uh, kind of work together uh, in terms of the whole financial adequacy uh, in, in, in this kind of an environment. Uh, and if you look around the literature, you will see uh, insufficient retirement savings being mentioned, uh, insufficient investment returns, the theme of this, uh, this webinar. And uh, related to that also is, is how do we think about risk framing management? And uh, I would add to that also the regulation of, of, pen, of, of, of pension systems uh, in terms of current, current realities. Uh, so let's start with the uh, the in insufficient investment returns challenge. So that's the uh, the next slide. And um, I think most of you are familiar with the old 60-40 rule of thumb. It's been around for decades, and it's kind of the default uh, historically for an asset mix policy for for pension funds. Uh, historically, it's generated uh, give or take uh, four percent real. Um, and with that kind of real return, um, you can generate an adequate pension at affordable contribution rates. Uh, don't need to get into the details uh, because that depends on, on you know, how long you work, uh, when you retire. Uh, but generally speaking, you can get um, good pensions, depending on how you define good, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of pay. And that seems like an affordable uh, way to generate pensions in a working life of 35, 40 years. Uh, but um, now we have a problem, and the problem is the theme of, of course, of this, this event, which is uh, that old 60-40 used to work fine when you had you know, bonds or stocks yielding or returning uh, four, five, six percent real, and uh, long-term bonds were doing nicely at, at two or three percent real. Again, depending on the time period you look at, you take 60-40 and it, it all works. Uh, if we now live in a world where real bond yields are negative, then 60-40 uh, doesn't work anymore. 
it can't produce that 4% real that we've historically depended on to make the pension system work. And so the, uh, the, the, the subject of this letter was, what, if, this is a, a, if this is a reality, and in fact, if it's not just uh, you know, on the real return, the negative real return, uh, it, it, it's just not COVID related, it's been a much larger, more macro issue for almost a decade now. And again, looking forward, if you look at you know, some, of the, uh, some of the drivers of that, uh, slower GDP growth, aging population, savings clubs, um, falling capital goods pricing, uh, falling capital good demand. All of these things are longer term phenomena. And uh, realistically, I think we have to uh, deal with the reality that um, those bond yields are going to stay very low for a very long period of time. And so this is not just a short term issue. This is a longer term challenge. Uh, what can we do about it? And that's the, uh, the next slide, Keynes to the rescue. And, and so let me give you the argument here. Uh, the first thing is, is that for long-term investors and sustainable uh, going concern, you know, pension systems um, can, can be deemed and should be deemed long-term investors uh, and the key point here that I make, and I've been making for some time, is uh, volatility, return volatility is not a good pro proxy for the kind of risk they have to manage. I know we've got you know, portfolio theory, capital asset pricing model, we've got a whole theory built around this notion that risk is volatility, but it's not particularly relevant for organizations with long horizon uh, their issue is, I call it, capital impairment. And those are the capital impairment examples. Uh, the 1930s, where you had a decade of, of capital destruction. Uh, and uh, businesses going under uh, for extended period of time. Um, if you put it in the context of World War II, Germany and, and, and Japan, large physical capital impairment examples. If you look post Second World War, we haven't had those kinds of events now for 75 years. And why is that? Well, because uh, Keynes eventually convinced uh, most of us that uh, shortages of demand uh, or other kind of problems can be dealt with proactively by governments. And so you have fiscal policy, you have monetary policy, uh, as, uh, as well as post-Second World War, a long list of collective international institutions. In my list here, uh, the, the UN, the IMF, uh, BIS, World Bank, uh, WTO, WHO, ILO, and more recently, the Financial Stability Board, uh, we've created uh, a, a, an environment to actually proactively deal with uh, financial crises and um, so far so good. And so with now the benefit of hindsight, we can say that for uh, long-term investors, equity investments have actually been low risk investments post second world war. So hold that thought, and now let's go to, uh, to, to Mr. Drucker, Peter Drucker, and see uh, where he comes into this story. That's the next slide. Um, I uh, first ran into Drucker uh, by reading his first book, first and only book on pensions, which he wrote in 1976. It was called The Unseen Revolution. And basically what he did is he took the, uh, the boomers at that time were still young, uh, but he projected a few decades further and saw you know, a, a very large co cohort that would eventually become retirees. And he argued that that would uh, have a number of implications for how we needed to think about generating uh, retirement income long-term. Um, I read, and, and what he said basically was, uh, you know, it, it, it's not just a, a pension design issue, although that's important in terms of sustainability, it's also about the kind of institutions that we need to create uh, 
in order to you know, manage long-term retirement savings. And uh, uh, so I, I took that up, reading that, and, and, and in terms of subsequent advisory work that I did, I had a chance to work with the Ontario uh, a task force in the 1980s that was, uh, that was tasked to look at the design and management of pension organizations in uh, public sector pension organizations in Ontario, which led to a uh, report in whose interest uh, that came out in 1987. And part of those recommendations was the idea that uh, we should uh, adopt uh, Drucker's recommendations as to what the key success drivers of pension organizations uh, should be in terms of uh, mission clarity, uh, good governance, and the ability to uh, marshal the resources necessary to be effective. And uh, something magical happened that doesn't happen very often. The, the re these recommendations were actually taken up by the Ontario government and the Ontario Teachers Federation, led to the creation of the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan in 1990. And, um, uh, it radicalized the management of uh, pension systems in the sense that uh, it started out with a clear mission. Uh, it started out with some very strong rules about creating a strong governance function. And it started out with having no constraints as to how the mission is best accomplished. Uh, and that led over time through a lot of insourcing scale, um, uh, flexibility in pension designs. Uh, eventually, uh, as more and more Canadian organizations picked up this model, it became international, it was written up uh, in The Economist about five, six years ago, is the Canadian pension model. And uh, the notion is the sustainable integration of pension design, governance and investing, uh, which over time uh, meant strong governments, strong insourcing, and the effective conversion of retirement savings into wealth producing capital. And by that, I mean that the notion of stocks and bonds almost disappeared and the, uh, the new focus became acquiring sustainable cash flows and nurturing those sustainable cash flows over time. The fact that the market would value those cash flows differently at different points in time wasn't all that relevant uh, as long as you had a pension model that could work its way through those ups and downs, which it, we can talk about this, is also partially uh, a question of regulation of how the uh, pension system is regulated. Uh, and, and my point out of all this, and this is uh, the bottom line, is that uh, I think it is still possible today going forward to, uh, to generate that sort of magic 4% real uh, which has been this, this basis on which to create um, sustainable pensions, adequate pensions at you know, reasonable contribution rate. Uh, the old 60-40 uh, is not going to do it anymore. Uh, a significant rethinking is required. Uh, we need to get rid of this notion that you know, equities are risky because they, they're, they're, they have volatility, price volatility that it's really about sustainable nurturing, acquiring sustainable cash flows that work in the long term. And if we move to that kind of model, uh, I believe that you know, it's still possible to, uh, to generate um, a, a pensions that are both adequate and affordable. So I'm gonna stop there. Hopefully this is, uh, provocative enough to, uh, to lead to a, a conversation. Uh, quite in contrast with, uh, I, I listened to Josh Rao's uh, presentation before this one, and um, you know, that was the old way that we used to do pensions, is, would, be my, uh, would be my observation on it. And he's quite right to say that that doesn't work anymore. Uh, we have to rethink of how we make this stuff happen. And uh, uh, what I've tried to do here is to you know, provide some of the factors and rethinking that needs to be done for us to have sustainable retirement system from today going forward. So thank you very much and happy to chat about any, any element of this presentation. Well, I think it's, uh, it's quite uh, insightful 
the first challenge I would like to throw out for uh, there, uh, Keith, is uh, whether equity, uh, and I'm now talking listed equity, uh, whether that is going to be sufficient or maybe even has been sufficient to um, take the place of the, uh, the underperformance of the negative rates for, uh, for bonds. Last time I looked at uh, just did this exercise uh, this morning, uh, the, the world index uh, with net dividends reinvested in Euro uh, over the last 20 years produced a, a return of 3.7%. That's far away from 4% real. Um, uh, last time I looked, the 30-year uh, the return on the, Japan, on the topics index was still negative 30 years to today. The Japanese market is still down over a 30-year period. So, in other words, what I'm leading up to is uh, increasingly you see pension funds and insurance companies moving to private markets, uh, private equity, private debt, uh, to actually compensate through an illiquidity premium for what may not be available in public markets anymore in public debt and, and, and public equity. Still, uh, I would put any, any ideas? Yeah. I would put it differently. Uh, I would put that you know, the organizations that really know what they're doing and what they need to do to be successful going forward is to acquire sustainable cash flows. Mm -hmm. And you, wherever you find them, you, you get them. If they're available in public markets, fine. If they're not available in public markets, well, go to private markets, uh, even get involved in creating them so mm -hmm. that you become a partner potentially in cash flows that don't even exist yet. You know, renewable energy is a classic example of you know, a phase that uh, we're gonna see a lot more of. And I think you know, thought leading pension organizations are gonna play a major role in facilitating the creation of those cash flows. Uh, mm -hmm. this, is a, this is not old portfolio theory anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a, a much more proactive approach to capital formation in which pension organizations play, play a proactive role. Uh, the example that I used in, in my September letter uh, as a sort of uh, example of the kind of equity that I had in mind was Unilever. You know, if you look, look at Unilever today, it's still yielding 3%. Reasonably, it's going to generate, you know, real growth long-term for another 1%. Three plus one is 4%. It's still there, and there are a lot of Unilevers out there, uh, you know, and and they're different from what you might call, you know, the very risky stuff at one end, where uh, it may or may not make it, or at the other end, you know, you now have sort of the future companies uh, trading, I think, very at, at very aggressive, optimistic prices, uh, but there is that middle ground, and it takes you away from indexing, it takes you away from just blindly taking what the market offers you, but being much more proactive about what you're trying to do and to proactively go after those kinds of investments. Okay. Um, one of the other initiatives that you've been involved with and it's in your most recent letter is the Global, Global Pension Index, uh, which essentially ranks different countries by the quality of their uh, retirement system. And the Netherlands is, is, has been and continues to be number one. Now, the three criteria that are being used there are the adequacy, the sustainability, and the integrity of the, of the pension system. Now, it strikes me that consistently sustainability is, is the dimension on which pension plans or pension funds uh, rank the lowest. Um, you just mentioned sustainability as an, as an important criterion. So why do you think it is that sustainability uh, receives that little attention so far uh, for the different pension systems across the world. Well, I'll give you an example of um, the way that pension regulation has been uh, dysfunctional in many cases this far to you know, this view as to what pension organizations should be doing. And ironically, the classic example is the Netherlands, uh, where you've had uh, for the last 10 years a very uh, strong solvency-oriented regulatory approach, which required the way that Josh Rao was, ex you know, was explaining that you have to mark your balance sheet to market on a regular basis uh, using risk-free discount rates on the liability side and you know, letting the volatility happen on the asset side. 
And of course, with that kind of out, and then if you have a, a, an environment where if you don't make, meet the, the solvency test, you have to cut pensions, uh, you end up with a very unhappy bunch of pensioners, uh, which is exactly what's happened in the Netherlands. And uh, guess what? They just, they're now going to throw out that solvency approach, which they should have done years ago, and move to a much more go and concern approach, uh, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is part of the Canadian model. So if you look at Ontario teachers, they've, you know, they've worked their way through the last 20 years very sensibly because they've been allowed to use principle-oriented type of regulation uh, where they've adapted through time to changing circumstances. And today, using a discount rate of 2.6% real, they are 106% funded. Um, I, I, one of the questions that's come in uh, sort of questions whether uh, a real rate of 4% is still uh, realistic. I mean, we've seen throughout the day that real rates have come down and um, they're, they continue to trend down. So uh, you, you continue to use the 4% real criteria. Do you see that that needs to be sort of adjusted downwards at some point? And, and what would be the trigger for that? Yeah. So I, mean, I, I, I love the, uh, uh, I actually knew Myron Gordon. You know, he's the, the inventor of the Gordon model. <laughs> Uh, which gets uh, return projection down to something that everybody can do because, you know, it says R equals Y plus G, right? Yeah. In real terms. So how do I get 4% real? Well, you know, it, it's, it's the Y plus the G has to add up to 4% net, of course, after, you know, after expenses. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can do that with Unilever today very mm -hmm. comfortably. And my mm -hmm. argument is there are thousands of Unilevers out there if you go out and find them. And so in that sense, and then the other part, the part that we don't see is, you know, this whole move into infrastructure uh, where they tend not to be, you know, tradable securities, uh, but more contractual arrangements of various kinds that are again calculated to, you know, to, to generate a projected real return. So it has to be based on realistic assumptions. But again, you know, it's still the question of how do you get to a Y plus a G that realistically equals 4%. And it's, okay. I believe it's still doable, it's just harder work. Okay. M maybe a, a, a last question. Um, and arguably, you could argue that, that over the last 40 years, the adequacy of the pension system has, has sort of deteriorated over time. That, uh, the pension system now is, is, is worse than what it was 30 or 40 years ago. That's sort of the gloomy view. You, you, um, I would like to end on, on an optimistic note. And, and what do you see is the most, the, the most positive development that, have, that has taken place over the last 40 years in terms of pension fund, governance, design, investment, any of those that I mentioned? <laughs> So you're giving me a softball here, Stan. Okay. <laughs> because <laughs> you know it, it, it goes back to the story I just told you. Uh -huh. Is that uh, is that retirement savings have to play a proactive role in wealth creation going forward, and to do that, it requires pension organizations capable of doing that in all of its manifestations. And it's the whole deal around uh, being proactive around changing the pension design and making it more flexible as times change and as you know, volatility starts to become too much of a factor from a solvency point of view. So there's a design element that, that, that needs to come into play. And then you know, the other element is that we've been through is again, this much more proactive approach to finding those sustainable cash flows that are, you know, and acquiring them at a reasonable price. It's an ongoing challenge. Uh, and I think the, the more of the global retirement system that we can get into that mode, the better off we will all be because you know, ultimately it, it is about uh, you know, sustainable capitalism. And arguably, that requires organizations that, that understand the process of capital formation and can play a proactive part in that in the best interest of the participants rather than in some private interest. And but that's our best hope. 
Yeah, but I mean, it sounds so obvious, motherhood and apple pie. Why hasn't the world um, taken notice and all moved the entire, entire teacher's way? Uh, you know, this now gets into, you know, how, you know, how does change take place over time? Mm. And I think, you know, when you look at it from that perspective, um, it has been 30 years, you know, yeah. since the formation of, of that, right. you know, that new idea and that new model. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the fact that it stood up for 30 years, you know, to, to, the, to various types of, of impacts, uh, you know, is a statement unto itself. Uh, the fact that you, you, you have seen the increasing adoption. I mean, you know, the large Dutch funds increasingly look like uh, Ontario teachers. Uh, what's been hampering them is this solvency problem that the regulators have thrown on. You get rid of that, and again, you create much more wealth creation power uh, through the Dutch funds. Uh, the USS, I mean, it makes me weep, you know. <laughs> The, the situation in the UK, again, around, you know, what are solvable, obviously solvable challenges and issues that can be mm -hmm. solved. Uh, you know, people in loggerheads between employers, uh, the employees and the regulators. Why can't they figure this out? I mean, the answer is right in front of them. Okay, well, on that positive note, uh, thank you very much for your um, insightful and uh, as always very uh, provocative uh, statements.